Hey folks, how you doing? They've uh, they finally admitted it. One one of the topics I'll be covering is that Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, has said that Ukraine. There's no chance of Ukraine, quote unquote, winning this proxy war. Uh, basically, all we're doing at this point is just trying to get them a better seat at the negotiating table. That's what he says. So basically, this is going to end exactly as so many of us in the independent media said it would with at a negotiating table. And yet we've dragged this thing out and we'll continue to drag it out as long as possible. But I'm going to get to that in a minute since he's already here. I want to, I want to start with uh, my esteemed guest. I'm very excited to have him. Uh, I had him multiple times on redacted tonight and uh, he, he does amazing work. He, uh, he's uh, a professor of economics. He's founder of Democracy at Work and host of their nationally syndicated show, Economic Update. And his latest book, his books are phenomenal. You should check them all out. But his latest book is The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. Yeah, it's funny how it fails to save us from itself. Why, why, why has that happened? Uh, but here he is. Uh, Professor, let's see. Oh, sorry. There you are. Yeah. Uh, Professor Richard Wolf. Glad to be here, Lee. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you here. Um, I, I know how long some of these answers take to these questions. So even though I've got your 15 minutes, I only have two or three questions planned because right. uh, these are these are deep subjects. And I love how how well you you cover them, how clearly you cover them. Um, I just wanted to start out with discussing uh, inflation because it is impacting so many people's lives. Uh, you know, basically the, the piece of paper I was told means this much now means 80% or 90% of that much. And it impacts my life. And why is it? And why is it happening now? Because, you know, we're, we're told that we all just need to, to tighten our belts and uh, corporations, corporate America is doing all they can to deal with this, to help us out. But really, I, I don't think they are. Well, you know, I don't want to scare anybody away, but the simple economics of this story um, is so straightforward and simple that you can understand why so much time, energy and money is spent trying to make it obscure, complicated, difficult to understand, and all the rest. So let, let me try to be as quick as I can. Uh, an inflation is simply when prices go up. There's no mystery. There's nothing complicated. It's a general notion that prices are going up. Not every price. Some can go down. Some stay the same. But in general, the movement is up. Okay? Number one. Number two. First question to ask, why do prices go up? And even to get at that, we ask the question, well, who raised the prices? It doesn't happen by itself. You know, it doesn't happen overnight in the grocery store that all the potatoes cost more than they did yesterday. Somebody does it, and we know who. It's the employers of America. If you've ever been an employee, you've probably noticed that your job description does not include setting the price of whatever it is you help to produce in your factory, your office, or your store. The boss does that. Employers are less than 1% of the population. So if there's an inflation, that 1% less is the one raising the price. There it is. 99% of us pay, 1% of us decide whether and when the price goes up. Next question, why would the employers raise prices? The answer is the same answer given to every other question you ask employers. Their job is to make money for their businesses. We're in business to make money. That's what they tell us. There's no reason to doubt them. Therefore, the answer to the question, why do you raise prices, has to be because it's the best profit strategy now available to me. Under these circumstances that we have now, I can make money by raising prices, so I'm going to do it. And if it weren't the case, I would be doing something else. 
for example, I'd be laying off workers or buying more machinery or moving production overseas. I do all those things when those are the best strategies to improve my profits. So there you have it. An inflation is when the business community, the employers decide that's the way they're going to juice up uh, the profit. And you can see why. They can't produce more goods because the Americans can't afford them anymore. They can't do that. They can't go overseas anymore because the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world is deteriorating at such a rate that it's becoming more and more dangerous, more and more iffy, if it even makes sense to spend all the money to move your facility overseas. So those options aren't there. We have a movement against immigration. So bringing cheap labor here has been kind of closed off. So the, the opportunities are shrinking. And one of those that's juicy and left is to jack up the prices. That's what they're doing. That's the issue. And if you wanted to stop it, what you would have to do is go right there and do that. And I think it's worth a moment to explain that we've done that in the United States. Conservatives have done that. The last example, Richard Nixon, August 15th, 1971. He goes on radio and television. He's the president of the country at that time. And he says, we have a terrible inflation, which we did at that time. And he said, I'm going to bring it to an end. And here's what I'm going to do. Tomorrow morning, that's the 16th of August of that year, if you're a business and you raise your price, we're going to come and arrest you and throw you in the clink. So my advice to you is don't do it. And as of the next morning, they stopped doing it. Inflation was over. It was supposed to go for 90 days as a kind of cool the economy down, but it was extended. It is usually credited with having gotten Mr. Nixon to win the next election because he had brought inflation to a stop. Yeah, uh, Biden has not mentioned that as one of his tools. No, he doesn't mention it, doesn't talk about it, has a case of amnesia, either general or specific. But you can't really blame him. You know, I like to make the joke that I was a graduate student at Yale University getting my Ph.D. in economics. And one of the classmates around the same time was this young woman named Janet Yellen. She's come a long way in the world. But I know what she learned because I learned it in the same room from the same professor at the same time. She didn't in, apparently did not advise Mr. Biden of what the history was, what he could have done. You know, the rest of the world is looking at the United States for many reasons these days as odd. And not the least odd thing is that not discussing rationing, that's what Roosevelt did in the World War II, not discussing what Nixon did in 1971, acting as though the inflation is this terrible new problem. It isn't new. It's a constant problem for capitalism. We have a variety of alternative solutions. The amazing thing about America, no discussion of any of them, not from the Republicans, not from the Democrats. We're going to raise interest rates, plunge the country into a recession. What a gift to the American working people. COVID, a crash, an inflation, and now a recession. That this country isn't more strangled up than it obviously already is, that's the mystery. So my next question kind of relates to uh, what's going on in Ukraine, but it's much larger than that. Uh, I read a great article, it might have been Michael Hudson, about, uh, about how we're seeing the, the great splitting of the global economy. Uh, we're seeing Russia and China uniting in, in a separate, really, economy, and the U.S., the petrodollar, the, the central, the Western central banks in the other one, and the U.S. is picking these fights, the proxy war in Ukraine, the, the trying to create a proxy war in Taiwan, uh, in order to try and force the other countries to get behind us, as well as justifying uh, you know, so many sanctions, with, such as all these sanctions we've put on Russia, which it seemed to have all backfired. But uh, can you talk a little about, is that what you're seeing, a great splitting of the, the world's economies? Yes, I'm afraid so. But I, I see it from a slightly different angle than perhaps other people do. There's no question that whether it would have happened anyway, whether it would have happened maybe a bit more slowly, 
the coming together particularly of China and Russia has to be a historic process. Russia is the largest country by geography on this planet. China is the largest country by population on this planet. Both of them are pretty closely allied now with India. That gives them virtually a, a, a power in terms of natural resources, people, location. I mean, it is kind of stunning. The Chinese know it. They are the growth miracle of our time. They are building this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, people should understand that most of the rest of the world sees the United States, and I believe this is an accurate perception, as being a declining empire, a declining power vis-a-vis -vis China leading an alternative contester. And we shouldn't be surprised. We were the rising power as the British Empire was declining. Uh, the British came up after the Dutch Empire declined, and so on. This is not a new phenomena. It's just a lot less fun on the way down than it was on the way up. Yeah. And Americans are having a hard time wrapping their heads, which I kind of understand. Look at the spectacle of England. Their empire has been over a century. They still don't seem to grasp it uh, in, in many cases, I don't want to be unfair uh, about it. But the rest of the world, and I mean all of it, is watching the decline of one and the ascendancy of the other. And they're making decisions at the local level, in the corporate world, in politics, because they're having to choose now. And they, here we go now, this is the scary part, they don't want to choose the loser. And the, the terrible fear here in the United States is that the whole world knows kind of who that is. So you better make it very expensive for anybody to withdraw. And so everybody is maneuvering. Let me give you some examples. One of the best allies the United States has in what it's trying to do in the Ukraine is the neighboring country of Poland. Okay. Poland joined the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh-oh, what's going on? Answer, playing both sides. Hungary is part of the European Union and is a complicated player there. They are the first country that joined the Chinese Belt and Road. Greece is now completely integrated into the Chinese Belt and Road. Even the Europeans, even those with conservative governments, even the Scandinavians are having to reassess. Yeah, they, they are showing America solidarity on Ukraine, but I'm afraid the honest explanation is that doesn't cost them very much, like very little. Meanwhile, they're cutting deals and trying to figure things out. And the sad thing is it's so far gone that what the United States is doing is almost making it worse. It is now trying to stop exports of American goods that might speed up development in China. That's way too little, and that's way too late. The Chinese have shown they can compete on all technical levels with the United States, outdoing them in a growing number of them. You can't do it. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. It doesn't work. And you'd be much better off coming to terms. And let me conclude by saying that's our history. When the United States wanted to be independent, we had to go to war with Britain, the Revolutionary War, 1776. The British lost. They were shocked. In 1812, they tried it again. They were defeated again. They couldn't do it. Meanwhile, the United States is growing and growing, and they, they threw in the towel. They cut a deal. They became an ally. All right, let's take a page from our own history. Maybe the best way to deal with Russia and China is come to an understanding of sharing the problems we have, starting with the climate, which we have to share around, and maybe make it a more general sharing so that we don't end up in fruitless, horrible wars, no longer contained in little enclaves like Ukraine, but becoming global 
and then it's all over and people feel that risk in the air more than they have in a, probably in, ever in our history. Yeah, I think uh, I, I like the example of uh, the British Empire because uh, I, I like that you point out that they kind of saw the writing on the wall. They couldn't accept it. They kept trying to retake America and uh, eventually they had to think of other options. I but, have to be a little careful with the British Empire because, you know, it went so far that Britain became the kind of, how shall I say it, uh, poodle of the United States. Uh, yep. And we don't want that image because Americans are fearful enough about what will happen with the Chinese. But at this point, I, I like to give people a reality check and remind them. The GDP, the gross domestic product, which is a simple measure economists use how big an economy is. It, it measures the total output of goods and services in one year of a country. So the GDP of Russia right now is about one and a half trillion dollars. The GDP of the United States is 21 trillion dollars. Everyone has to keep in mind that's the relationship. It's David and Goliath. And it's not too happy which one is which, but you can figure it out. Where's China? China has a GDP of 15 trillion. It's the success story of this century. No country, let alone a big one, let alone a desperately poor one, has done this kind of explosive growth in this short a historical span. Those That country has figured something out. We would be way better off learning and exchanging what they figured out about growth and how to make a poor country rich, which is the number one problem of this planet, maybe not visible from the United States, but it should be. We'd be much better off working something out and learning than this confrontational approach of slowing them down and prohibiting them and sanctioning them. None of that works. It never has. It's not going to work now. Um, Russia is doing well economically relative to the West. I mean, they have their problems. The war is costing them. No one should have illusions about that. But the notion of the big, powerful U.S. just dictating, that's over. And the sooner we understand it, the less damage we're going to be doing to ourselves as well as the rest of the world. All great points. I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, China has taken 800 million people, I think, out of uh, extreme probably. poverty, which is what two United States were over two United States is worth of people uh, yeah. in just the past you know few decades. But thank you so much. Uh, I, I know your time is very valuable, and uh, it's great having you here. I highly recommend everybody check out Economic Update and Democracy at Work. And uh, thanks again, Professor Wolf. And thank you, Lee. Uh, you make people laugh, but you make them think as well. And that's a double gift. I appreciate it. Talk soon. All right. There he was, Professor Wolf. Uh, hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, I see some of you saying that uh, Rumble is not working. Um, I'm trying to see if that's correct. No, it seems to be working for me when I go to it and click play. Uh, I'll put the direct link here in the comment section. Uh, I don't know if that will help at all. Maybe that will uh, help you guys find it. Anyway, the, the reason people are talking about the Rumble stream is because this will become only a rumble.com slash Lee Camp stream soon in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to get to the, the topic the, that is the, uh, the title of this video. Um, that and, and you know Richard Wolf and I did mention it this the, the our proxy war in the in Ukraine which many top American officials have now admitted it took them a while but they've admitted this is a proxy war this is between the U.S. and Russia and we are willing to have countless tens of thousands of innocent Ukrainians die so that we can wage war with Russia in a separate state a separate country and pretend we're not at war with Russia. And it's uh, it's disgusting. It's repulsive. It's morally uh, 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 just morally repulsive, morally bankrupt. And meanwhile, all the people that believe in this, that believe we should fight Russia in Ukraine to the last Ukrainian uh, will look at us. You know, those of us who understand the reality, those of us talking about it and go, oh, how dare you? How dare you tell the truth? 
Well, here is a statement from uh, Tony Blinken, our, our Secretary of State. And first, I just want to show you, for those of you who aren't familiar with what Tony Blinken looks like, uh, okay, he has no pupils, right? That is a, that is a straight-up lizard person, right? <laughs> That's a straight-up lizard person. And no pupils, but yet the rest of his face, other than the no pupil, I'm going to suck your soul and take you over to the, the dark side, like in the movie Ghost, where the, the things come out and draw your soul away. That's, that's what he does, I think, when he speaks to you. But outside of just having no pupils, uh, he, he the rest of him looks like he's going to sell you like a, like a blood transfusion that's going to keep you younger. Like, I, I feel like that's, you know, probably what he does on his weekends. Sells, like, blood transfusion to the ultra-rich coming from, you know, it, it's like virgin blood or blood from uh, puppy dogs or something that, you know, you, you'll keep your young. You'll, you'll live an extra 40 years if you have puppy blood in you because puppies are so young and playful. It'll keep you young. You know, just like a real fast talk and like used car salesman, except it's used blood salesman. Uh, I challenge anyone to prove me wrong on that. So that's that's Tony Blinken. But this is a statement that was just put out two days ago by Tony Blinken, uh, re reposted here by the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. And... Here he is. This is just a few days ago. U.S. Department of State. Immediate release statement by Secretary Tony Blinken. And there's plenty of hilarious propaganda in this statement, such as nearly six months into the unprovoked and brutal assault on you. Uh, brutal, yes, because all war is brutal. Uh, unprovoked. <laughs> I love it unprovoked. Now, I'm opposed to the Russian invasion because I'm opposed to all war and all bombing of innocent civilians, etc. Now, that doesn't mean they're aiming for innocent civilians, but in every war, innocent civilians will die uh, if it involves the type of bombs that we use these days. Um, but unprovoked? It was provoked for fucking years. Years! They've been provoking years. The U.S. has been surrounding Russia with missiles, surrounding Russia with NATO, expanding NATO, creating a, a Nazi-backed coup in 2014, putting in our guys that will do whatever the fuck we want. Unprovoked. Anyway, filled with loads of, loads of propaganda. But this is the key part of it, which is really ground a groundbreaking admission when you think about it. And hardly being talked about or covered by almost anyone. Tony Blinken, Secretary of State. And by the way, I think he's making most of the, you know, like half the foreign policy decisions. Biden's not making any. The rest are probably made by the Pentagon. But Tony Blinken says, we will continue to consult closely with Ukraine and surge additional, oh, this is after sending weapon systems, more weapon systems to Ukraine, by the way, and surge additional available systems and capabilities carefully collaborated to make a difference on the battlefield. And here's the key part and strengthen Ukraine's eventual position at the negotiating table at the what? I thought Ukraine was going to win this war outright. I thought this was going to end with the U S giving some missiles to Ukraine and then Ukraine beating Russia and Russia running away. And that's how it was going to end. And that's why it's worth fighting a proxy war where we allow tens of thousands of Ukrainians to die and millions to be uh, uh, displaced. I thought that was how it was going to end because that's the only reason to really fight, right? Not, not at a fucking negotiating table. If it was going to end at a negotiating table, we should have negotiated from day one, right? Meaning we, meaning we who are pressuring Ukraine, the U.S. government pressuring Ukrainian officials. I mean, they basically own several of them. But if it's going to end in a negotiating table, then fucking do it now and save tens of thousands of lives. How about that? There's an idea. And it's what 
Many of us on the left, many of us who are anti-war, were saying from day one, fucking don't fight a proxy war in Ukraine. Fucking sit down with Russia and hash out whatever deal is going to end this now, rather than killing so many innocent people, rather than emboldening Nazis, rather than, than destroying the infrastructure, the buildings, destroying the lives I mean, yeah, displaced sounds nice as compared to killed, but displaced can destroy a lot of fucking lives, all right? A lot of kids get their get their childhoods destroyed. A lot of families end up broken up, divorces, everything else, suicides. So displaced may sound nice compared to being killed, but uh, not so nice. Anyway, this is a massive omission by the American government. And it's, you know, quietly put in a little statement by Tony Blinken because the U.S. has known this, but the U.S. doesn't give a shit about Ukrainians, innocent or otherwise. So the U.S. is willing to send loads of arms, loads of missiles, loads of advanced systems to try and fight this war that they know Ukraine will lose, as they're admitting here. So all all they claim now that they're destroying Ukraine for is a slightly better hand at the negotiating table. But as this goes on and on, and Russia is the more powerful entity here, do you really, no matter how many arms the U.S. sends there, do you really think that Ukraine's hand is going to get bigger, stronger? You think they're going to get stronger hands if you just let them continue to try and fight a much more powerful much more heavily armed military? Or do you think their negotiating hand gets worse by the day? Oh, it's so fucking sick to watch the U.S. do this. And here they are. And think about the admissions. So, I mean, I, you know, look, I hate being right. I hate being this right. Because it, 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 you know, It'd be great to be wrong and that, oh, we're actually, the U.S. is actually fighting this for a just cause. We're actually doing this because we want to help people and we were helping Ukrainians. Awesome. Wow. I was so wrong. That's so great for them. Uh, But of course, that's not the case. I'm I'm not, I'm not that wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, So the, the, uh, it, 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 many of us were saying from day one, there, there, were, there were several key tenets on what we were saying from day one or, or before it even, even began. We were saying Russia is being provoked. Uh, there are agreements like the Minsk agreement that was made with Russia that the, the Ukraine is completely not abiding by. Uh, and they're not abiding by it because they were advised not to by the United States and the United States wanted to expand NATO, NATO et cetera. Uh, we said that Russia was being provoked in this. We said that uh, that there that this could be oh, this should be over now at the negotiating table because it will be eventually. This will end with countries sitting down and agreeing to certain things. So if it's going to end at the negotiating table, do it now rather than later. Uh, and also, we were saying that the U.S. was lying to you and the media was lying to you about the truth on the ground, and all of those things have now been admitted. We said it was a proxy war. These things have been admitted by many high-level officials, okay? The proxy war thing, I've played videos on this live stream of the number of officials and uh, even people in Congress, I think a couple of Republicans, admitting this is a proxy war, calling this a proxy war. Uh, So those admissions have come out. But some, but it's not just Republicans. There are uh, uh, Leon Panetta, the former head of the uh, uh, CIA, right? Uh, he he said it was a proxy war on national television. Uh, so you have those admissions. Then you have the admissions that the that the U.S. government is lying to us about what's happening there. Um, that was even covered by NBC News. I've I've shown that that article and headline and uh, and the revelations multiple times on these live streams. Even NBC News covered it. That in a break from the past, the U.S. government has admitted that they are saying things are happening in Ukraine that are either not happening or 
are they're relying on what they know is faulty intelligence. So they know it's probably not true. And they're doing that and they're acting like it's true because they're fighting an info war with Russia. So this is NBC News, fucking liberal corporate monstrosity, NBC News, covering our government admitting that they're lying to you about Ukraine. So that admission's been there. And then this is kind of the final admission. This is the this is the the end admission that this is going to end at a negotiating table. There is no chance of Ukraine winning this, no matter how many fucking missiles we send over there. And all this does is destroy people's lives. And the U.S. wants it because, as I said with Richard Wolf, we're in the great splitting of the world's economy. The world's economy, the U.S. is a fading empire. And we believe that proxy wars like this, and we're trying to create one in Taiwan. That's why Pelosi just went there. Uh, proxy wars like that help to distract the military forces of, of our enemy, quote unquote, enemies, Russia and China, who should not be our enemies. Uh, they help get the other countries that we view as, that the U.S. government views as feudal states, uh, like France, Germany, NATO countries, Europe, various countries surrounding China that we view as feudal states. It helps get them in line because they weren't they weren't in line enough. You know, France and Germany particularly were doing business with Russia. The Nord Stream 2 multi-billion dollar oil pipeline about to open up. Uh, and as, as Richard Wolf also mentioned, several of these countries uh, in the in the Eurozone have been doing business with China on the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, you end up. You, you end up with, with, we believe that these proxy wars will help get those countries in line. And to some degree it does, but for the most part, it's just a fucking catastrophe that kills people. Um, but this has to do with us being a fading empire and we are willing to, we don't, we don't care how many Ukrainians die, try to protect the U.S. empire from fading a little bit. We don't, the U.S. government doesn't give a shit if, if fucking all of Taiwan gets obliterated in a nuclear catastrophe. The U.S. government would be celebrating. They'd be like, all right, who cares about them anyway? And it looks bad for China. Ha <laughs> ha! But like, these people are sick sociopaths. Tony Blinken doesn't even have pupils. He doesn't even have pupils. Okay? <laughs> He's got black vampiric eyes that I just showed you. And th there's nothing in that soul. There's nothing there. And, and, and here's what we're doing. This is what we're doing with our power, with our trillions of dollars. It's just so sick. Uh, but, th but you know, these are key admissions. Key admissions. U.S. government has now admitted they're lying to you about Ukraine. They've admitted that this ends today a uh, negotiating table and they've admitted many of them have admitted this is a proxy war there you have it even joe biden accidentally admitted it's a proxy war because he said he ad-libbed a line at the end of his speech and you don't want joe biden ad-libbing goddamn anything you, you let joe biden ad-lib all of a sudden he's talking about corn pop and his leg hair and it's just a mess it's just a mess that a bunch of little people with their fucking notepads all run around trying to trying to fix uh, but so he ad libbed the line about how uh, th th we need to get get Putin out of power. Was he? He was a speech on Ukraine, and he gets to the end of it and he goes, "This uh, Putin can't stay in power," which was an admission that the U.S. is fighting this proxy war to try and cause regime change in Russia. Which you can sit here and argue about whether you want to see regime change in Russia. Fine, have that have that debate. But that doesn't mean that's what the U.S. government says they're doing right now in Ukraine. Uh, by the way, it's insane to fucking push for regime change in Russia because you're, 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 you're tickling nuclear Armageddon at the ball sack and seeing if it goes off. Uh, let's tickle its ball sack and see if it responds. But anyway, so Biden has accidentally admitted his proxy war as well. All right, folks, uh, this live stream will continue at rumble.com slash Lee Camp. I'm about to continue my series, a, a multi-part series on the 43 reasons that capitalism is unredeemable, uh, that capitalism will inevitably collapse. 43, not just a couple, 43. 
Uh, I'm going to continue that series. I'm also going to, uh, if you haven't already seen it, at the end of this live stream, I'm going to play for you my new episode of The Most Censored News, my new show at Behind the Headlines and Mint Press. But uh, yeah, that's on the that, that, that new episode is on the third party that uh, Andrew Yang and several Republicans have gotten together to create, which is a clusterfuck. It's like, I mean, honestly, it's like they, they were like, you know what? We only have a fuck, but we need a clusterfuck. Can we get together in a group? Is there a group of us? Is there a cluster of us that could get together to, to cause this, to cause this fuck storm? Cause it's just, it's not enough of us right now. Andrew Yang was like, right now I just have a fuck. I need a clusterfuck. If anyone wants to join me and a bunch of Republicans were like, we're here for you, brother. We are here for you. All right. Anyway, that's what the episode is on. My latest episode of most censored news, the most censored news. And I will play that at the end of this live stream, but the rest of the live stream is at rumble.com slash Lee camp. It's free to watch there. Rumble.com slash Lee camp, rumble.com slash Lee camp. R U M B L E.com slash Lee camp. And if you feel like you just got a dollar out of this episode uh, already, like it's not even over yet. We got to have it left, but if you feel like you just got a dollar so far, Please become a member at LeeCamp.net because the lowest level is $1.25 a week. Uh, so it will not break the bank, but I hope you'll become a member over there. And I do members exclusive uh, Q&As every Friday where I take topic ideas from you guys. I chat with you. Uh, we really get to get into it that way on Fridays. And it's every Friday, the, 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 the members only live stream. All right. Let's switch over to rumble.com slash LeeCamp. And, oh, I'm coming to London. Shit. Before I do that, before I cancel anybody, uh, I'm coming to London, uh, performing live in uh, October 12th. So if you want to see live stand-up, me and Graham Elwood tape a live podcast, Government Secrets, uh, George Galloway will be there, Eleanor Goldfield. It's going to be a hell of a night. And that is October 12th, London, England. And uh, 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 the tickets are at my website, leecamp.com. Just click on schedule and you'll see the tickets there. Um, also, I just tweeted it out. So you can look at my Twitter at leecamp. All right.